Good afternoon, everyone. It's 1 p.m. on Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. I called a meeting on Parks, Enterprise Services, and Culture and the Arts meeting to order. I'd like to welcome Committee Vice Chair Okimoto, Council Member Cordero, Council Member Kia Aina, and Council Member Say. Good afternoon, everybody. Pursuant to Section 92-3.7 Hawaii Revised Statutes, this meeting will be conducted as a remote meeting by interactive conference technology with the following procedures in effect for the meeting. Members of the public will be allowed to provide oral testimony on all items on the agenda when each item is taken up in two ways, in person, in the council chamber, and remotely via video conference or phone. Before testifying, each person shall state their name for the record and will be limited to a one-minute presentation on each item. All persons who have registered to testify in, this per, uh, in, uh, testify in person will be called upon first. When the timer goes off, please conclude your remarks promptly. Persons who have not registered will be given an opportunity to offer testimony following the registered testifiers. Once in-person testimony has concluded, I will proceed to the remote registered testifiers. For persons who are testifying by video conference, when your name is called, please monitor your screen and unmute your audio, your audio when prompt. For those who are joining us by telephone, I will identify you by the last three digits of your phone number. When your number is called, please listen for the prompt to unmute and press star six. Persons who did not register will be given an opportunity to offer testimony by using, by using the raise hand feature in Zoom to be called on. So friendly reminders and tips, video conference from a quiet location if possible. If you are watching the proceedings on Olelo, please mute your television when you are called to testify. When the timer on the screen reaches zero, please conclude your remarks promptly. HRS section 92, Dash 3.7 requires that all voters at remote meetings be conducted by roll call unless unanimous. Uh, therefore, I will first call for objections, and there, if there are any, I will call for a roll call vote. Written testimonies include the testifier's address, email address, and phone number will be available to the public as described on, post, on the posted agenda. As a courtesy, please turn off all cell phones for the duration of this meeting. Thank you. I want to welcome Councilmember Tupola. Moving on to item number one, City Council Communication 96 20 or 2023, sorry. This is a draft committee report on the review and evaluation of the Board of Parks and Recreations pursuant to Ordinance 17 44, codified as Chapter 3, Article 15, Revised Ordinance of Honolulu 2021, as amended. The committee will take action on the report making recommendations to the council on whether the charter provisions establishing the board should be retained, amended, or repealed. After due consideration, the committee finds that the board was able to achieve many accomplishments prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, since the start of the pandemic, there have been significant issues that prevented the board from meeting and being able to do its work. The current administration is working to fill all board vacancies and restore this entity to its full capacity. Based on uh, the findings, the committee recommends that the board be retained under the charter and continue to fulfill its powers, duties, and functions as prescribed by the charter. The, that no modifications or revisions to the board membership number, number and qualification organization's purpose or powers duties and functions under the charter are needed at this time. I'd like to call up from the administration, Director Laura Thielen. Good afternoon, Director. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Laura Thielen on behalf of the Department of Parks and Recreation. So we do concur with the um, committee report. We would like to keep the advisory board for the Parks Department. Um, we did have a number of people uh, resign for personal and health reasons due to COVID, and we are in uh, communication and lining up um, new board members, and we hope to be bringing those to the council for confirmation um, in the next month. Members, do we have any questions for the director? Council Member Codero. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Director. Um, 
as I mentioned last hearing regarding this uh, board, it, they have been very helpful for many, during many instances uh, in relation to a number of my parks in my district. And I was wondering, you know, thank you for the timeline, but how many board members are on the Board of Parks and Recreation, first off? Nine positions. Okay, and how many are you looking to fill? We have uh, one that is remaining. We have um, eight that we are in conversation with, several or the majority of which have already filled out their paperwork. Um, so again, we're, we're hoping to be able to bring um, all of them to be able to move forward with the board and reactivate it uh, by the summer. Okay, and prior to uh, the pandemic, where, how often did the board meet and um, what were the public capabilities or accessibilities to the board? You know, it was interesting because when I applied for the job, I read that there was a board and I searched online for board minutes and the like and I couldn't find them. So one of the things that we're doing during the pandemic is to be a little bit more organized um, to set up a more formal process so that people can uh, access the board. And so we will be uh, posting minutes. Um, we're going to need to be efficient with our time, but I think we can post recordings and agendas and point people to the time and the recordings. Um, but we do want to make this uh, access to the board members a little bit easier for the general public. Um, and so we, we've been trying to get those things in place too. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, that accessibility uh, is going to be great for the board because um, a lot of neighborhood boards, of course, will want to get an op the opinion of the board or have that the BPR uh, take up certain closures for certain parks. And I know that uh, because of vacancies and the lack of accessibility uh, from neighborhood boards or even um, council offices to find out information, it uh, the process that it took for, let's, um, for one mall that was in my district, Ka'uluwela Mall, this was a few, few years ago before I was in this position, um, took a long time and it took uh, a few months and instances uh, through our neighborhood board assistant and to the mayor's rep and just lots of efforts to get to the board of parks and recreation and then waiting for their vacancies to be addressed and and all, all of that. So that, those are the reasons why I, I asked, just from past experience. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council Member Tupola. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, ha I had a similar question because I had four or five people I wanted to recommend, but I was also trying to look for the minimal um, qualifications, meeting time so that I could tell them what would be expected of them if they were even interested. So is there any uh, one pager that I could still send to them if they are interested in possibly applying to be on the Parks Commission? That's something that we can work on doing because I know even if we come with a full board um, to the council, there will be turnover in the board over time. So we're starting a file and what we're telling people is if they are interested to send a letter and a resume to us and then we can keep them on file so as we have openings, we can fill them. Um, I can have them do that. I guess if you could work on the one pager, just because I think for some people, if they saw maybe like the amount of times they have to meet, they might be like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm interested. So just something really basic of like how many hours a month would be required, like what kind of uh, things you guys are looking for them to do. Anything basic, because again, I couldn't find anything because I don't want to lead them down this path, like send your resume and then this huge time commitment that they're like, I never signed up for this. So I do want to help you guys. I know there's a lot of people in my community that love the parks, love them. And so I want to get them involved because I think they could be really influential on this level as opposed to the neighborhood board level that takes multiple discussions and not just parks discussions. But there are many people that just want to have the parks discussion. So I want to send them to you. And even if they don't join your commission, I want them to join those meetings because then those conversations are very focused in on what they really want to talk about. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, anyone with more questions? Okay, I'll now proceed with in-person testimony in the council chamber. When I, I will take the person who have registered to testify first. When I call your name, please come up to the podium, press the on button at the base of the microphone and begin stating your name, uh, Michael Waters.
Wrong button, there we go. My name is Michael Waters. Um, I want to thank you for what you just said. And I would also, whatever happens here, I would hope that you guys would evaluate the leadership of the Parks Department. It's not anything personal, but I have all the faith in the world and Deputy Director Kehal Nanipu. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think. Is Angela in? Angela? No. Angela Young? Okay. All right, so that was the last person on my Chair, she's remotely. Okay, okay. Uh, is there anyone who uh, would like to testify on this item in person? Okay, seeing none, I will pursue to uh, remote t testimony. And I believe we have one. Yeah, Angela, is Angela in? Oh, Angela on? <laughs> I want to welcome uh, Council Member Hawaii. Okay. Is that remote testimony? Chair, Angela's not responding. Okay. All right, seeing none, no one members, uh, we are in discussion. Okay, the chair recommends that the committee report be reported out for scheduling of a public hearing and adoption. Any objections? Any reservations? Hearing none, so order. Okay, let's move on to item number two. Presentation by the Department of Parks and Recreation on proposed amendments, including uh, in Bill 19, 2023, relating to city parks. Members, since Bill 19, 2023, addresses many aspects of commercial activities in the public parks, including permitting, recreational stops, fees, and penalties, the chair will organize discussion by topic and uh, applicable uh, sections and provisions of Bill 19 over the course of several committee meetings to encourage discussion and public input. Due to the complexity and extensiveness of the bill, the chair recognizes that the community engagement is necessary to establish an appropriate system that uh, facilitates controlled use of city parks, but considers the needs and the concerns of the community. This meeting will focus on recreational stops. And the proposed amendments, including in Bill 19, as it pertains to recreational stops. And accordingly, today we will consider the sections and provisions posted on the agenda as follows. Bill Section 2, pages 3 to 4, ROH Section 10-1.1, recreational stops, definition. Bill Section 5, page 14, ROH Section 10, Dash 1.3, adding recreational stops to subsections A regarding permits. Bill section 6, page 15, ROH section 10-1.6, including recreational stops and subsections B regarding citations. And bill section 8, pages 17 to 20, ROH section 10-1.0, uh, recreational stops. In the, in the interest of efficiency, the chair requests that you restrict your remarks to, uh, to uh, restrict your remarks to recreational stops for this meeting. Discussion on other aspects of Bill 19 is planned for future committee meetings. I'm gonna call up um, Director Thielen from the Department of Parks and Rec. Thank you, Chair. And I really appreciate this council uh, scheduling the bill for discussion and we will postpone any decision making um, and encourage discussion over several committee meetings so we can hear the testimony and consider um, thoughtful amendments to the bill. Um, if I may, before getting into the discussion on the sections that you mentioned, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, so we wanted to do just a quick picture we have this also posted on our website, so people can take a look for it there. Um, I'm looking at our PIO for our website address. 
honolulu.gov slash parks. So this first slide, what you can see here, these are parks, are shorewater parks, whoops. These are the shorewater parks that have additional site-specific bans or restrictions on commercial activities. These are the parks that a majority of the testimony are from people in these communities who have uh, worked with this council to put in additional bans or restrictions on commercial activities, primarily the Lanikai, Kailua, Waimanalo, and then portions of the North Shore, and most recently, Kokololeo on the Windward Coast. The next slide shows the beach right-of-ways that have additional bans or restrictions on commercial activities. And again, these were in the same legislation or ordinances that came in front of the council, primarily in the uh, Lanikai, Kailua, Waimanalo, and North Shore area. Um, the following two slides, oh, sorry, let me stop for a second. This is a listing of those 17 shoreline parks uh, or 16 uh, improved parks and one unimproved park, and then the 35 beach right-of-ways that were in those two pictures that have the additional bans or restrictions. This slide is a slide of all of the other shoreline parks around the island of Oahu that have no additional uh, bans or restrictions, just the regular base restrictions on commercial activities. And this is approximately 50 shoreline parks around the island. And the next slide shows the beach right-of-ways that do not have any additional bans or restrictions around the island. So what we're here today to talk about um, we know that most of the opposition that has been received are from the, the very good people in those communities that had worked for years to put additional bans or restrictions in place. Um, and it's going to be up to the council about how to handle the, the ordinances that are currently on the books. But we certainly want to be talking about an approach to be dealing with the commercial activities at the other beach rights of ways and the other shoreline parks around the island that do not currently have any additional protections or restrictions. And I've worked side by side with many of the good people that have worked for years in the, the Kailua and Waimanalo area and had the pleasure to you know, meet with some of the North Shore advocates. And as I said, all of these are very good community people that want to protect their communities. I don't think any one of them want to leave the other communities with nothing. I don't think any one of them want the other communities to suffer from an overabuse or unregulated commercial activities. So what we wanted to talk about is uh, the proposal we've put forward as a draft to begin the discussion. What are the restrictions that we're proposing island-wide and beginning with the recreational stops for the buses? So we took a hard look at what was in the ordinances for Kailua and Waimanalo on the buses, because we thought that there was a lot of good things in those ordinances, and how could we apply them island-wide to be fair uh, for all the communities? So the first thing that we did in the first sections, uh, pages three to four, in the definition, um, we took out the term commercial bus stop. And the reason we took the term commercial out is if you have a commercial requirement, you have to prove that there was a payment going on. And we all know in many of our beach parks, in addition to the uh, legitimate tour companies that are advertising, that are going and taking tour buses around, you have the unmarked vans, the people that are coming on in and they're doing commercial activities and they're trying to fly under the radar. If we have to prove a payment was, was made in order to do enforcement in an era of Venmo, when people are paying online and there's no cash being transferred at the beach park, we're never going to be able to prove a violation. So instead, in that definition of recreational stop, what we looked at was the size of the vehicle. It could be commercial or non-commercial, but if it's sized to carry 12 or more occupants, it has to have a permit. It has to, or else it cannot be in a park. 
um, and we tried to make it very cut and dried. We figured 12 and above was larger than a minivan that a recreational or you know a regular resident would have, but that's open for discussion. But we did also hear in meeting with the tour bus industry that there are some companies that are operating vehicles that are more customized tours, smaller than 12. So we included in the definition any vehicle, regardless of size, where it has the Public Utilities Commission license. So it can be smaller than 12 and it's still going to be regulated under the definition. The other thing we did is in the definition we said a stopping or parking in a park for any length of time. Many of the people who advocated in front of this council years ago, they know that under the rules there's a 15 minute grace period. So a commercial vehicle would stop in a park, somebody would call the police to say this is in violation of the law, the police may be busy, they arrive like 90 minutes later, the vehicle's gone, or the police arrive and the vehicle says, you know, 45 minutes later, oh, we just got here. Uh, we're during our 15 minute stop, we're about to leave. So what we proposed in the definition is it's stopping for any length of time. It's eliminating the 15 minute grace period. So if you're a vehicle sized to carry 12 or more passengers, or you're a PUC licensed vehicle that's smaller, and you go into a beach park, if you do not have a permit posted in your windshield, doesn't matter whether you just drove in there, that is a violation under the definition. The other thing that we did in the bill is that we were looking at um, other ways that we might be able to pick up uh, vehicles that are smaller um, that may not have a PUC license. So we took a, a page out of the Airbnb legislation and we said if you just have a vehicle parked in there that is advertising, including marking on the vehicle that advertises outdoor recreation activities, that's a violation. Now I have to tell you, the Corporation Council is still reviewing this to see whether that passes constitutional muster. Um, and so it's under review and we'll be working with you to see if we can put it in there. But we thought that that would be another avenue to just say, you know, somebody who's parked in there, maybe you're under 12 occupants, there's no PUC license on there, but if you've got the marked vehicle that's advertising the outdoor commercial activity, that in and of itself in a park would be a violation of the law. And then two other items that we put in, in uh, page the, the 16, but also 18, section eight of the bill, is um, we said the recreational stops, even where they are permitted, they should not be permitted at any unimproved parkland, because this is by definition land that's not been improved with a capital improvement to support this type of activity. So that would just by definition in the ordinance not be allowed. And we also said that the recreational stops would not be allowed at any beach right of way. Not just the ones that are currently in the ordinance, but all of the beach rights of way. Because again, these are generally in uh, residential neighborhoods and they're not areas that are really designed for bus loading and unloading. These are residential streets. So this was a, an attempt to take the best of what was in the existing ordinances and apply it around the islands to provide these kinds of protections for people at, near beach rights of ways, near unimproved parklands, and at beach parks. Um, some additional restrictions that we put in is in areas where recreational stops would be permitted. No recreational stops on the weekends or on state or federal holidays. So recreational stops would stop on a Friday night and not begin again to Monday morning or also including this, the federal or state holiday. And the reason is this is when most of our residents will flock to beach parks and they are at their most congested. And it's not really an ideal time to be having large vehicles going in and out of the parks at that time. Um, we put in proposed limits on the number of uh, buses that would be allowed um, under these recreational stops and a size limit. And again, these are open to discussion 
Um, but we needed a starting point for the discussion. So we said at beach parks, we should not be dealing with vehicles sized to carry more than, I'm sorry, I don't have the, I think it's 20, 28, 28 or 25. So it was passenger size uh, 12 to, I'm gonna say 28, but let me just double check on the section of the bill. And we would not allow vehicles above that size in a beach park. Again, a lot of our beach parks, the parking lots are fairly small, fairly tight. We do not want the 40 passenger coach vehicles going in and out of the parks. Um, we talked about limits of no more than three buses at any given time. 90 minutes maximum time for any given bus and no more than 10 buses on any given day for any given park. Um, we put in that the department would have the authority to temporarily close any park to any recreational stops. So say there's construction going on or there's been a storm that's hit or a fairly large event that's permitted for that area and that the department could also adopt rules to further limit uh, or even ban vehicles from certain parks due to listed reasons like sensitive places or lack of facilities. And then we took a look at enforcement because enforcement is a big issue that comes up time and again in the community. And so there's that section um, six where we're looking at using citations. The typical enforcement for a violation of park rules is a petty misdemeanor, which is a criminal uh, charge. So what you have to do is prove every element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. Years ago, the uh, council decriminalized uh, parking citations. And we do have parking citations in chapter 10, which is the ordinances that deal with parks. The maximum citation allowed under chapter 10 for a petty misdemeanor is $500. But we looked at the parking citations in other areas and we saw that what they did in order to be a deterrent, because $500 may not be much if you're earning several thousand dollars per stop, um, you can make every hour a separate violation. And at the suggestion also when we met with HPD, they said, why don't you include escalating fines? So if you've got a repeat offender, you can then take it into the petty misdemeanor criminal. And so we wrote in the citation that if you are in a vehicle and you go into a park and you don't have a permit posted in your bus windshield for that park for that time, that is a $500 citation. Every hour is a separate citation. And if you have two or more citations in a two month period, you're subject to a citation and the petty misdemeanor criminal charge, which can include imprisonment. So I think that covers the main points on um, the approach that we took on recreational stops. Um, we do want to hear, you know, from the community on kind of the how much would be uh, okay versus not okay. We definitely want to hear from the communities that currently don't have protections in place. We want to hear from communities whether they support the idea of not having recreational stops at any beach right of way, and if people are in agreement that we should not have them on unimproved parklands. And if in the testimony, uh, council members want us to come back to the next meeting with more data and information. So we gave you today the listing of parks that have the additional protections and then the, the parks that do not have those additional protections. If there's additional information that you want about parks, we can go and research that and provide that back to the council and to community members as we continue the discussion. Thank you, Director. I know we have lots of questions. I know I have lots of questions. So I'm going to open it up uh, to the council members. Council Member Kiaina. Thank you for those maps. Can we get copies of those maps? You can. We will get you copies. As I mentioned, they are also on our parks website. And so people can go and take a look at them as well. And then as we engage with more dialogue, if there's more information we want to add, we can put that up on the website as well. Okay, because it's be helpful so that we can educate ourselves and help um, 
share information with the community. Thank you. Anyone with questions? Councilmember Okimoto. Thank you, Chair. Mahalo, Director Thielen. I had a couple of questions. Um, and you mentioned that you had taken into effect um, the prior, the current status of state of this this um, ordinance. And I, I wanted to understand, I know you mentioned that you had adjustments, but what exactly is not right with it currently? Because the testimonies that have been coming in from the community there, that's what they have fought hard for. And I have follow-ups after you kind of explain what the purpose of um, changing it so far from what it is currently. So as I'm reading the testimony, the, a bulk, the bulk of the opposition is coming in from the um, 16, the communities surrounding the 16 or 17 shoreline parks and unimproved park that have uh, additional restrictions that they want to retain those additional restrictions. Some of the things that we have in the draft bill um, are aligned with that. So for instance, no recreational stops at any beach right of way. That currently is in the ordinance only for a select number of beach right of ways. In the draft bill 19, that would be applied to every beach right of way. The existing ordinances, I think, protect one unimproved beach park from uh, commercial activities above and beyond you know, what's in the, the general law. The proposed Bill 19 would protect every unimproved beach park from any recreational stop from any bus. So um, I think the big difference would be that in um, the existing ordinance, there is an absolute ban on recreational stops at certain beach parks. And in Bill 19, it's proposing under island-wide, uh, the beach parks would allow up to three buses at a time, um, no more than 10 buses per day, and only Monday through Friday, uh, and not on state or federal holidays. So that would be the big change that those 16 communities, I think, as I read the testimony, where they have a ban, would prefer to keep the ban. Thank you, and I, and I, under, I appreciate you being trying to find that balance of what the community wants. And I've always been a supporter of our local businesses. But So thank you for explaining that. I do think that there's still going to be a struggle. My One of my concerns in reading um, um, what's being proposed right now is the, and we've talked about, I'm sure you've heard about this, how, how feasible it's going to be to enforce this. Wouldn't it, I think I'm, I'm looking at, we already we've talked about the shortage of our HPD. Um, and I know we had the parks come with their ranger program. Wouldn't it be more beneficial to give the parks, park rangers the authority to, to site? Currently, you have, I think, about three to 400 vacancies. And I'm guessing because we haven't had the, this is with um, contracts and city employees. I'm guessing because we haven't had the system right now in place of having rangers with the authority to go and, and site. So now we have an influx of commercial activity that's not helpful or healthy to the community and to our local beaches. But wouldn't that be more beneficial to allow the rangers to have this authority? Because I do have concerns about us being able to enforce everything that's being proposed currently. Yeah, so we, we agree with you. Um, the way this is written by turning the recreational stops into a citation as opposed to a petty misdemeanor, um, we would want to dovetail that with the uh, bringing on rangers and to give the rangers ultimately authority to do citations for commercial activities. Because we think that that would be a more effective way of doing enforcement on commercial activities rather than having to go through the criminal justice system. So we wrote Bill 19 to kind of get to that end point. Um, we, right now, the contract rangers that we're bringing on under the ARPA program do not have enforcement authority. And frankly, we, you know, we're not ready to have contract people go out and do enforcement. There's a lot of training that we would have to do and, and the like. So part of that program is to get us up to speed on that. In the meantime, we have talked to HPD by transitioning the recreational stop into a parking citation. That is a simpler thing for them to be able to do. And we could work with them 
to handle because again, it's not taking up time to have to go into criminal court and to have to prove all these elements and to build the case. The parking citation under the ordinance is fairly simple. It, it allows you, if the vehicle's there, you can cite the vehicle. You don't have to prove who's the owner. You don't have to prove the owner is there. They've, they've made parking citations much simpler. And frankly, when, when Kailua um, and this council adopted the ban, the initial ban on recreational stops at Kailua, they used that same provision and they got to compliance much more quickly using that civil citation process. So we think that this would be a much more effective way and ultimately uh, is something that park rangers could take on. Okay, well, if I could ask one more question along the same lines. What are your thoughts on the director, you or your position being um, in charge of making these, these decisions? My, my issue is making these across the board um, regulations, because every community is different. We all understand that and did some research. And, you know, for example, on the Big Island, their their ordinance pretty much gives the director the authority specifically to make the decision based on the park or the community. Whenever I feel that government is getting really big and overreaching, I, I do pause because I feel that this will be a big overreach. You're making across the board statements that I do still, I still have concerns even with you sharing about the enforcement of it and how it's gonna impact the communities as well as the local businesses. But wouldn't you think that it's more prudent for the director to have the authority to just identify for each community specifically versus making a blanket statement, which might seem, um, more efficient, but I do worry that what's going to happen is we will make blanket statements or across the board regulations that will not be specific to each of our communities. So Councilman, I, you know, I appreciate that because communities are unique. Um, I think there needs to be a balance where the council would set a, a policy call on what may be allowed and under what circumstances would the department have the authority to do additional regulations within kind of that window that the council provides. So what we had done in Bill 19 is to give that overarching um, comfort to the communities. No on the beach right of ways, no on the unimproved lands. Um, yes, at the parks for vehicles of these sizes in these days, now, if the department wants to go beyond that and work in communities to do additional restrictions, the bill would give rulemaking authority to the department to do that. So that was a balance that we said is, you know, you, you can set the big picture window on kind of the level of commercial activities that's allowed at the max and the location where it's allowed and not allowed. And then if, if you want to give the department authority to go work with individual communities, then maybe there becomes you know, a little bit more variation um, based on that. But, but you would set the maximum of what's allowed because I think the community is asking for some certainty um, on the commercial activity. And both the people that are in business as well as the people that are residents living next to the parks is they kind of want at least some some consistent boundaries that they can understand and apply. Okay. Thank you, Director. And I, I think it's important you mentioned the communities and although my district is not a coastal district, I know that we were each elected um, to represent the people who trusted us with their votes. And for me, I hope that as a, as a body here, we can remember when you look at the testimonies, it's kind of staggering that the input from the community is not in support. So I hope that as we move forward, I know that each of us here are really um, sensitive and we care about what the community states. And so I hope that we can really take into, um, into consideration the, impact, the input from our community members as we move forward. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, questions? Council Member Wire. Uh, mahalo, Chair, uh, and Director for being here. And you know, wanted to say thank you, Chair, for um, doing this as an info briefing for discussion, uh, meaning that Bill 19 is not gonna get voted on today, um, provides an opportunity for uh, the community to provide input and testimony. Um, and so, of course, I'm interested in hearing the testimony on you know why the 17 already regulated parks or unimproved park um, should be maintained, uh, but then also in contemplating these other spaces 
uh, that don't have protections, like you mentioned, Director. Um, I also look forward to any ideas from the community about how, um, you know, how those parks should be regulated so we can maintain, you know, a proper balance and not continue with this over commercialization of our parks. And so I wonder, Director, how did we arrive at uh, 10 stops a day? Again, it's just a starting point for discussion. Um, we needed something to focus people on the discussion. So I guess part of the question is, would you allow buses to come into some parks? And what we said is, uh, you know, we think there should be some allowance, uh, given that this is a big part of our economy and it does employ many people. So we restricted the days to the weekdays, the hours, and we restricted the size. And then we were just trying to think of, okay, what's a number? There are different ways to regulate tour buses. You may want to say there are parks that are larger, that have, you know, multiple facilities, and maybe they can bear, you know, a, a larger number of buses or a larger size of bus. And there may be parks that are smaller that should have none. But we, we in going through this, we wanted to start the discussion to get the testimony from the public and then start to sift through, okay, if we did it this way, what would it look like and how many parks would it be? If we did it that way, what would it look like and how many parks would it be and where would it be? And so I think then we can maybe start to arrive at what is the best way. We just admit right off the bat, what we laid out there was just to start the discussion and we know that it's going to be amended. No, I, pr I appreciate that clarification and your willingness, you know, to talk through the complexity and acknowledging that, you know, we have the 17 parks that we can kind of table in terms of conversation. And so appreciate Councilmember Kia Aina, Vice Chair Kia Aina's um, CD, uh, which I would support, uh, you know, excluding the 17 parks already regulated from these changes. But again, in coming back to what you're mentioning, um, I agree, you know, like, I think that's something I would like to hear from the community too. So outside of the parks that are already regulated, you know, because my gut says, you know, 10, 10 truck, 10 a day is kind of a lot for some of our smaller parks. And maybe there are bigger parks, again, outside of the 17, where that's a little more feasible. But, you know, I do want to know what the community's thoughts are. Uh, you know, we see like Punalu'u is seeing some of these uh, vans come through. And so it's like maybe smaller parks should have a lower number. You know, so look forward to the conversation. Mahalo. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Tupola. <clears throat> Aloha, Director. My question was in regards to the 12. I mean, I'm just looking at the bill that's posted online, so perhaps there's something I'm not looking at. But in the written one underneath commercial, it just said that, hold on, I'm going to pull it up the use of a passenger vehicle of any size designated and operated, but then I thought you said a little bit ago, 12 passenger vehicle. I'm on page four, number two, underneath recreational stops, but I didn't know if you were like hypothetically talking like that that could be a discussion. I just was trying to differentiate between what I'm reading and, and what you were suggesting. So if you look on page three, it uh -huh, has there. the definition of recreation stops, and there where it's saying um, entering, parking, standing, or stopping for any length of time. Uh, it's a commercial or non-commercial vehicle sized to carry 12 or more occupants or by a licensed motor carrier. And licensed motor carrier is defined up above as the PUC licensed vehicle. We made exceptions to the recreation stops. So we, what we did is we actually looked at the um, bill that had been put in for Waimanalo Beach Park years ago because the community there had a lot of discussions and they, they didn't want an all out commercial ban. They wanted to be able to do like the Gabby Pahinui Festival and certain other things. So we put exceptions in there what you're looking at on page four. Oh, I see what it is. is. It's an exception to it's that. It's an exception. So a mm. school field trip by a uh, school recognized by the state DOE, which could be a public or private school, if they rent a bus to take a school field trip, that's not counted as a recreation stop. If it's a handy van or a vehicle designed to carry you know, uh, passengers, it's not a recreation stop. If it's a city vehicle, so like the bus is going through there, 
not a recreation stop. And then we also said, if you've got a vehicle, you know, a large size vehicle for a, a, a DPR permitted event. So we have a canoe regatta and let's say a club and, you know, parking is tight. So the club is going to rent a minibus to bring the canoe paddlers to the park. Our permit for that canoe regatta would include, you know, the covering that bus that would not be considered a recreation stop. Understood. Thank you very much for that help. Um, my next question was about your statement regarding fines and penalties. Is that in here or are you just suggesting some different types of uh, ways we can look at that? No, yeah, we put that in here. So let's see here. We're on page 17. Okay, I'm on 17. Because I was just looking at the commercial stops, but this is yeah, so this is, this is why it took us a while to get you the bill. This ordinance is not an easy ordinance to amend, so you're having to hop back and forth. But under page 16 and 17, you'll see section 7, starting at the bottom of page 16, section 10-1.6 of the revised ordinances of Honolulu, subsection D, penalty. And it's got penalties 1, 2, and we added a penalty 3. So penalty three is the recreation stops without a permit or stopping within a vehicle with advertising outdoor recreation activities. So any person who violates or causes a vehicle to violate the following sections, and it's referring back to all of those sections, um, including where you see section 10 dash blank, those blanks will be filled in ultimately with whatever gets passed. Um, They'll be fined not less than $100, but not more than $500. Every hour a vehicle remains parked, stopped, or standing in violation of those sections shall constitute a separate violation for purposes of issuing citations and fines. Any person incurring more than two citations under this subsection within a two-month period may be subject to a fine and by imprisonment for not more than 30 days upon conviction. I see it. Um, I don't have any suggestion right now, but Chair, I guess my concern is um, there's a lot of gray area, right? You have the owner, meaning the owner of that business. You have the person driving the car. So is the person that showed up that maybe didn't know the law fined? Is that person fined? Is the business fined? Is the business then suspended from coming to the park? Or, you know, because it's saying that this person could go to jail, but what if the business is owned by multiple people? I'm just saying this, I just got to think through this because to just say, okay, you are advertising. So if the kid who works for the owner who's doing it, do we find him and then throw him in jail? The guy working for the kid, for the, the guy who owns the surf company, is the surf company guy going to get talked to? You know what I mean? Like, where, where I just want to make it as effective as possible and not just like a blanket like, oh, you're here, so we're finding you. Oh, we're finding you again. When really someone should talk to his boss and be like, do you guys know what the law is right now? And are we going to follow that? And then if there is an ability to work with the business through them understanding it as opposed to just going straight to jail. I'm just saying there's just a million laws on our books that just throw people straight in jail. And I'm like... Well, first off, we don't have a lot of space in the jail. Secondly, like, are we trying to educate? So back to kind of council member Okimoto's uh, comment about the Rangers and like, how can we utilize that to be more of an educational point instead of punitive? My last thought is in regards to the sizes of the parks and the stops, I had the same question as council member Wire, which is how do we get to 10? And you said maybe we could have it for different sizes of parks. Every time I've spoken about this bill, I've always said that the parks in my community that are are right next to houses are so different than other parks because the uh, houses share a wall with the park, right? So it's a little bit more different when those parks go off with noise and all kinds of other things because people are just right there adjacent to everything happening. So where in this bill would you suggest that we would delineate something like park size or park proximity to homes? Like what is your suggestion there? I hear what you're saying. I think maybe exploring where that goes. So I think that's part of the discussion is if, if not every park, what parks would be considered for lifting off, we can then go do some research and take a look at, you know, what would that mean? Because we don't know if you said, you know, parks next to residents, how many of the 67 shoreline parks do we have are next to residences? I, I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head. So we can go and take a look 
and we can look at other ways of categorizing parks and listing which ones, and that can be um, information that we can provide back to the council for further evaluation and discussion. Yeah, I think, I, I guess it might be in the admin rules or it might even be in the chart that you guys have for the recreational stops where it might have to categorize them there as far as the size of the park and then as well the, the proximity to homes and why that number might need to go down as far as stops are concerned. Because I can't even say that the ones that I have that are near residences are small or big. They're both. <laughs> some are tiny, tiny, some are really big, but they're also adjacent to homes. So I'm not sure in those instances that size really matters as as much as the res residents feel very overrun by how close it is to their house. So um, those are all my questions. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Kiaina. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Chair, for having this discussion because I think it's so important in light of the laws that were passed for uh, the 17 parks and 35 beach, of, beach right of ways. Uh, I do know that there is concern in other areas, including in my district, uh, that would like to see more regulations. Having said that, um, my, my communities remain concerned about this process moving forward without consideration of my proposed CD1 uh, to delete the repeal of the prohibitions. Um, and I guess I would recommend that at the next uh, hearing on this measure that we consider adopting it so we can all move forward with clarity on a uh, direly needed discussion. Because uh, for, uh, Council Member Okimoto, the reason there's so much opposition is because people felt threatened. And that's not helpful to this process because they, they don't, they're not even focused on anything else except to safeguard uh, what they have. And I believe that if we were to take that away then all of us could uh, breathe a little better and have the appropriate and robust dialogue that we all want. Uh, if that does not happen, every hearing moving forward that you have will continue to have people who oppose the bill. And they're not opposing uh, being able to help others, they're trying to safeguard um, what they have. And I believe that my CD1 adequately addresses that. So I guess my question to you is, uh, would you be opposed to us adopting the CD1 at a future hearing so that we can move forward and have the dialogue that we all want on the remaining provisions of Bill 19? So, Councilwoman Kia, and I appreciate the, the proposal. Um, the mayor, he did sign the most recent uh, Waimanalo bill, but at the time he signed it, he did say at the um, press conference, that he was gonna bring forward an island-wide approach, that that was his preference, uh, both for fairness to the communities across the island, as well as for enforceability, so that we have something that's consistent and understood uh, and can be enforced. So the recommendation from the administration is rather than adopting the CD1 at this time, allow the discussion to continue about the where and how to regulate recreation stops at island-wide, and then we can then go back and take a look at, you know, if we've arrived at something that people feel is a good way of regulating it, then let's look back at the 1617 areas and say, how would those regulations fit with what you've got? What would change? In some cases, like with the beach right-of-ways, it would be the same. So it, it wouldn't be an issue. But in other cases, if people say, you know, we've come up with a uh, decision on how to regulate buses, if people in those communities still feel very strongly that, no, we don't want that, we want to keep an all-out ban, and we don't want to adjust, and I think then the council has that discussion, because you're the body that's going to make the decision ultimately on what to do. Okay, uh, well, thank you for sharing that. I guess if you told me that you would have... Uh, uh, done an island-wide ban comparable to what we have on the books, then I wouldn't be bringing this up. But the fact is that uh, we'd, we don't have that here. So um, I guess, Chair, I am recommending that at the next meeting that we adopt the, uh, consider the CD1 for adoption so we can move forward. Uh, 
you are not going to enjoy continuing this dialogue, I can tell you, uh, not only for those who are here in the audience, those who are watching, it is, the numbers are only gonna increase and we're not gonna be here, we're not gonna be able to hear the dialogue. So that's just my recommendation. So we heard what the administration wants, but I think we as a council need to determine uh, the best uh, route to move forward. And I feel that it's not a good uh, dialogue to be having right now because uh, people are direly concerned. I have been receiving pictures of increased activity because tour buses on their own uh, see think that they don't have to abide by the rules. So there is an increase of tour buses in Y Manalo as I speak because of this dialogue. And so we can't have that. Uh, rather than, uh, I guess, continue this, I, I guess I just, what kind of dialogue do you guys want? You're gonna continue to get the majority of people opposing this, which is not what you want, right? And you're gonna have, you're gonna have people here and, and online opposing it. So that's just a suggestion, but thank you for your explanation of why you guys did it. I don't necessarily uh, 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 disagree. I do know that the mayor said that, but I uh, still feel that we should have at least held the line with regard to where we are and that then we move from there. I don't feel that we're there. I feel that our laws are stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Wire. Yeah, uh, just briefly, Chair Mahalo. And I just wanted to echo um, what Councilmember Kia said because I do think um, given that today's just an info briefing and that we have her pending CD, I do think there are a lot of folks that um, aren't present because they feel like there is a meaningful conversation and that uh, the 17 parks um, aren't gonna just be, you know, have their, their protections taken away. And so I do think passing the CD would give a little bit more of a buffer because, um, you know, once it's posted and that there's anticipation to roll that back with an, a posted amendment in the future, then that would kind of give the community notice that, okay, now we're having a, a conversation about these 17 parks being rolled back in. And so I just share that procedurally because I do understand um, that it hopefully is a long-term conversation. Um, and I'll, of course, defer to you how the committee is gonna go, but I do think that, like Councilmember Ricky Aina said, we wanna make sure that we're able to focus in on what best serves you and the committee in terms of identifying outside of the 17 parks, what restrictions do we wanna have apply to all the other ones? So mahalo. Thank you. Uh, anyone with questions? Okay, Director. Uh, I do appreciate the conversation and I know uh, this is a very sensitive subject and I know that uh, we will find, I'm very optimistic and that's why I really enjoy the process and what we're doing right now. So the bill defines licensed motor carrier which is permitted by Public Utilities Commission authorizing the transportation of persons. What types of vehicles would you would this apply to? Tour companies, limousine services, other transportation providers, even does this include large tour buses? This would include uh, large tour buses. These are the licensing for people um, that are authorized to transport people as opposed to you know hauling fill. Uh, that's a different type of licensing. But um, one of the things we can do is we can also work with the Public Utilities Commission um, you know, to, to get the fine-grained distinction that they have between the different type of licensing. But my understanding is this is the definition they use and the licensing term they use if they're licensing a vehicle to carry passengers. Thank you. And, um, in the definition portion of recreational stop, it states operators of commercial or non-commercial vehicles seized to carry 12 or more occupants. Would a local family like or a church group with 12 or more passenger van be required to get a permit? So we picked 12 because we thought that the general public does not usually have vehicles above 12. If we have a church group or somebody who's getting a picnic permit, from DPR and they're gonna bring people there in a bus that would fall under an exception because we have accepted from this definition of recreation stops a DPR permitted activity that would include bringing people in, you know, in a larger vehicle. So they could rent, you know, a bus from a bus company 
put the permit for the picnic up in the window. The canoe regatta could rent a bus from a bus company, put the, the DPR permit for the canoe regatta up in the window, and that would be allowed. Okay. The bill now requires companies to obtain a permit for recreational stops, and the permit will say the location and time. Does the department currently have an idea on how they will administer issuing permits? For instance, for instance, if a company has daily stops at the beach park, will they need to apply and obtain a permit every day? So we did put in the bill, if you look at the end of it, uh, when it becomes effective, and we were saying at least six months or possibly longer after it's enacted, once we know what the terms are, we've already started talking with the Department of IT about how to do online permits. Uh, when I was at DLNR, we did wedding permits and we made them online. Uh, DIT has told us that would not be a problem. They could do a lottery system. Um, we would like the tour companies to weigh in because we did start a conversation with them. But I think we need more information for where permits are allowed how should we deal with some of the logistical issues they have? So for instance, they may send a group out and then hit a traffic jam due to construction. So we probably can't have a precise time, you know, in order to give them, but that's where we have to have that dialogue with the tour company. And I think, um, yeah, we've started, we started the dialogue, but that needs to continue. But part of the discussion had to come here to the council too, to see, you know, what are the restrictions gonna be? Um, and then we can start to work with them. Okay, in the bill, page 18, item, uh, bill, item B, four, it says no recreational stops at any public park other than beach park or beach support park. What does that mean? I'm sorry, I'm trying to find what you're looking at. Page, page 18, mm -hmm. item B, number four. Says any, oh. yeah. Yes, so what that means is you would not have buses going into, uh, tour, tour buses, again, doesn't have to be commercial, but you would not have these large size buses going into any other inland park. So again, we have exceptions for school field trips, handy vans, city vehicles, other DPR permitted events, you can bring a bus in, but a tour bus shouldn't be stopping at, you know, Mililani, Ma Mililani Malka Park. You know, we we're talking about having recreational stops would only be at a um, beach park or a support park, which is defined as a park that's across the street from the beach. In the bill, page 18, subsection C1, it says 10 to 25 passengers should it be uh, 12 to 25 passengers to align with other parts of the bill? So when I did do an edit of this, I found two errors. Yeah. So you just pointed out one. Yes, it should be 12 to 25. Okay. The other error is in the citation. We actually moved some things around. So now the citation is for riding a horse. And so we need to switch that to the proper, the proper thing. Awesome. The bill says recreational stops shall be permitted only on weekdays, Monday through Friday between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m., excluding holidays. Under this bill, will companies be allowed to make recreational stops during the weekends or evenings without a permit? No, and they would not get a permit for the week weekends or evenings or holidays. So again, this is for the council to decide, but the administration recommendation is part of the balance for the, the tourism industry is if we do allow recreation stops at beach parks, um, we should reserve the beach parks completely for residential recreational use um, on the weekends and on the holidays because that's when most working people are off, that's when they are their most congested. So the proposal that we're making to you is no buses in the beach parks on the weekends or the holidays except for those exceptions. So a handy van could go, again, a canoe regatta could hire a bus to bring people in for a permitted event, but you're not gonna have tour buses on the weekends or the holidays or at night. Okay. The bill says no more than three passenger vehicles displaying a permit for recreational stops uh, may be parked at the beach park parking lot at the same time. So how did the department decide on three? 
similar to the no more than 10 a day is it was to start the conversation. And again, we recognize that there may be a preference to regulate it differently. Um, this is where we want the tour bus industry to come to the table and to start to talk over ideas. I think there's a little bit of a uh, back and forth with the industry in that they would prefer no regulations. But I we need them to come to the table to say, if we're going to be regulated, this is the way that would work for us, you know, on an island-wide basis. Um, so the, the no more than three at a time, no more than 10 a day, is just a starting point for the, the conversation. Okay. The bill says that recreational stops shall not exceed 90 minutes. How did the department decide on 90 minutes? Um, that's usually the time for the tours that come on in for the picnic permits are about an hour and a half. So that's what we base that on. Okay. The bill will allow the department to adopt rules that could limit the number of permits for recreational stops issued at particular parks or ban recreational stops at certain beach parks. How would the department decide on how would they limit the number of permits for recreational stops or ban recreational stops? What criteria does DRP plan to use to make sure determinations? And does the department already have an idea about what beach parks would be restricted through uh, this discretion? So in passing the ordinance, the council has a choice. It can either get down to the very specific, you know, park by park, how is it gonna be regulated? Or it can set kind of a higher level policy and then give the department direction that you can go forth and pass regulations to provide additional restrictions. What we've proposed in this bill, we would have to go through the administrative rulemaking process. So under the state law, we have to go through a chapter 92 public process with a public hearing, public notice, public testimony. Uh, the proposal would have to go before the Small Business Regulatory Review Board and ultimately have to be signed off by the mayor. So it's a fairly lengthy process. What we put in the bill is kind of the guidelines that the department would have to use if we were going to f make further restrictions. So the guidelines that we would have to use would be in the ordinance, things like the facilities, are there sensitive places located there? Are there you know, some additional reasons that um, would fall into the uh, primary recreational purposes that you would have additional restrictions on recreational stops. And we would then have to take that out to the public before the department could adopt that. Okay. Couple more questions and I, I apologize, uh, Council Member Wire, we might need to uh, extend parks just for a little bit today. No problem. Thank you. Uh, does the department currently set permitting fees? We will have deposits for certain activities, and then I think we may have some minor fees for certain things, but that's not a standard thing. And what we have proposed in this bill is that where the council feels it's appropriate for the department to authorize commercial activities, and some things are already in the law that's authorized for a commercial activity, the surf lessons, the scuba and the like, we're proposing that the council give the department authority to adopt fees by rule and that the fees can include the, the cost of managing the program, including the cost of compliance, ensuring compliance. And that would be go to things like the rangers to go out and make sure that people are um, doing their commercial activity in compliance with the law. Does the department have any idea on how much the, the permit fee will be? No, but what the Corporation Council has told us is under state law, the city does not have the authority to set a fee to make money. So the state has the authority to do that, but it's not delegated that authority to the city. So we would have to uh, quantify that these fees are tied to the actual cost of running the program and the actual cost of, say, any ranger program and the amount of time that they spend you know, ensuring people are in compliance with their permit. If the permit is revoked, the bill requires the managing director to review the appeal. Is this a normal duty of the managing director? Uh, <laughs> many people go to the managing director uh, to 
make complaints. So this would just make a formal process of it. Okay. So current DPR administrative rules include regulations of recreational stops in parks. How would this bill affect all current rules that already are in place? And what changes would this ordinance make to existing permits and procedures? The ordinance would have two pretty big changes. One is ordinances, um, they, they trump rules. They take priority over rules. Under our rules, there is a 15 minute grace period for uh, recreation stops. And as I mentioned when I was giving an overview of the bill, that's basically made the rules on recreational stops unenforceable. Um, so this bill would just say, you have to have a permit for a stop of any length of time. Um, and frankly, for the recreation stops, even though we have rules that authorize permits for recreation stops with limits, my understanding is we haven't given a single permit out. There's not a single application for it. Most people are operating under the 15-minute uh, grace period. Thank you, uh, Director and committee members for the discussion. Before we go to the testimonies, I'd just like to remind the public that regarding Bill 19, uh, it is my intention that we take our time to gather information, listen to the community, and come up with the best version of the bill uh, possible that ensures our parks can be enjoyed by the users and can also serve our communities. Today we are focused on recreational stops and in the future committee meetings, we'll discuss commercial activities, commercial filming, commercial special event filming and permitting fee schedule. Uh, if you'll be testifying today, keep your testimony to a time limited and focus on recreational stops. We do not have more, um, we do have more, uh, another item after this, agenda and um, thank you to Council Member Weil for extending our uh, parks meeting today. So at this time uh, I will proceed to in-person testimony in this in the council chamber. Uh, when I call your name you can uh, come up and you know address your name and and you can go ahead and testify. Um, Maya Lisa Otis followed by Lourdes Milan and Kapua Maderos. Aloha, you know me, I'm Yalisa Otis, and I am still opposing Bill 19. Um, I see the value it has towards other communities, but Ordinance 22-3 needs to stay in place as written. Waimanalo has fought for Bill 38 for years to keep our coast from Makapu to Hunananiho free from commercial activity, commercial photography, and today, recreational stops. And I know we talked about what Mayor Blangiardi says, but I have a pledge here from Mr. Blangiardi that signed in 2020, and it says, I support projects by the city and county of Honolulu that are planned with adequate community input and engagement, allow the community to actively take part in determining its own needs and priorities, and also to uphold Native Hawaiian rights and cultural resources and respect any historical or archeological sensitive areas that may include cultural artifacts or burial sites, which is Hunaniniho. Although a discussion is important, a quarter of this island already had many discussions leading, telling the council what we want. The decision has been made. So let the laws that protect Waimanalo, Kokolulio, North Shore, Kailua, and I'm forgetting something, um, be the epitome example of how over-commercialism should be handled. Some may think that we have a lot of room for our beach parks, but our shores are historically significant. Waimanala will not stop until our laws are honored and our community is respected. I just wanted that pot, that ring reminded me that today, April 5th, 2022, just last year, our bill has passed. So we want to see it through. Recreational stops seep into our residential areas and neighborhoods. Since this bill was introduced, there are four incidents of recreational stops and then a lot more that I didn't see. We want no recreational stops for any size, anywhere, at any time. They're already back and we don't have the infrastructure and we don't want it here. Here's an example. This can, was on a weekend. Can, I know, I... By the you, way, yeah. here are buses. This is Saturday, this was last week. And this was just the day after that. We're just inundated. So I'm getting to it. My solutions are 
follow PUCs, um, you know, how, they, how they've been doing enforcement, which is $1,000 per violation, or two or more, you get $5,000 violation. And I think the rangers can funnel in those simple emails that we email the photos of, and they can funnel it for the citation. Um, we need signage and enforcement, and the city needs to do more. We can't police our community on our own. And I have one more sentence. There should be more patrols for the tour operators and vendors. HPD should, be, should give out citations while Bill 19 is in discussion because all I've been getting is missed pups. Like, you called, we came, and we said, can you just not be here anymore? So that's just not cutting it anymore. Um, HPD should also report a tally of commercial activity calls to the neighborhood boards. I want to be clear that this isn't all on HPD. It's poor management and accountability of the city's lawmakers to implement the current laws. Please keep Ordinance 22-3 as is. Continue to stop commercial activity and recreational stops in Waimanalo. Consider putting communities over commercialism and people over profit. The blanket of enforcement should start with the quilt of laws that already exist. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lourdes Milan, followed by Kapua Maderos, and then Doreen K. I don't want to slaughter people's names, so if I just say the initials, forgive me. No worries. Thank you for hearing us. My biggest thing is simple. Please keep Bill 38 in play. Keep it in play. We're more than willing to help out in any way how to make other parks or other communities safe. Like you said, we have the problem where it's not what signed last year. You guys barely brought this up a couple of weeks ago, and now Hunanejo is being indicted with big, huge tour buses. They don't care. And that was a problem that we had. And it wasn't just them. It was the wedding industry. It was also, yes, you apply for a permit, not a problem. They were making copies of the permits and giving it to every single bus they had because there is no, hey, it's one specific permit for each specific bus. That was another issue that we were having when we were fighting for this. This is why we fought to protect. This is why you guys are here, because we ask you guys to help protect. Thank you. Kapua Maderas, follow. Oh, oh, can you please state your name? Please state your name, sorry. <laughs> yes, state your name before your testimony. Sorry, Lourdes yeah. Milan. Thank you. Aloha, uh, Chair, and uh, members of the committee, Parks and Recreation. My name is Kapua Maderas. Um, I am a, a resident of Waimanalo. Um, I also grew up in Waimanalo. Um, I um, have just a few things that I jotted down while I listened to the uh, director, Thielen, um, going over their um, presentation. So I am for, uh, I, would, I would be fine with having recreation, recreational stop designated stalls, meaning that once those stalls are filled, no more buses are allowed in our parks. So if you just had three stalls, and once they fill those three stalls, just like a handicapped stalls, then, you know, that's, that's it. And they can't come no more. It's an, and it could be fined. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It can be fined. It can be cited easily. Um, wow, is that my whole time? Um, posted no commercial activity signs also, because there are none. Um, that, that tells them right up front they're not allowed. Um, PUC and bus limits. I would like, I, I understood the PUC and the bus limits, like limiting it to just three vehicles a day, but who is gonna sit there all day, every day, to monitor that and then enforce it. Because Mia Lisa does it at Hunananiho when she's there. Jody Green does it when she sees it come out of her window. Um, Auntie Doreen does it when she's visiting. We all do it when we're there. 
But who's going to sit there all day, every day, and make sure it's happening? Because you can write laws from here to kingdom come, and if it's not being enforced, then there's no sense of going through all of this. Um, we are anticipating having the park rangers there soon. We were hoping that they would hire from within our community instead of bringing in outsiders who are not familiar with what happens. But giving the park rangers enforcement abilities would actually be a benefit to us as a community. And then PUC education before licensing, that would be an also a plus to educate each each person applying for a PUC license of where they can and cannot go, what they can and cannot do, and of all of the risks that they will take and the fines, stiff, stiffer fines, um, or just a list of approved parks that they can go. And I would suggest that we make all those parks from Waikiki to Honolulu because they are big parks and they are already used to having tourists there. All right, that's my suggestion for now. Um, I also want Hunananiho to stay protected. Hunananiho to Makapu'u to stay protected. That's what we fought for for three years um, because of all of what we had to go through as a community. Um, it took hours and hours of my time to gather my community and gather support from all over to get here to these hearings um, and to send out a lot of information and to help people understand the laws to get that bill passed, not for it to be um, erased one year later. All right, mahalo nui, aloha. Thank you. Up next is Doreen Kulo, and let's see, followed by Kerry Johnson and Louisa Keave. Aloha, everyone. I think I checked the wrong box. I wasn't going to testify anything. But I am a resident of Waimanalo since 66 and saw many, many changes. I stood at Hunananiho. I had a regular job. I, I came every day after my job and stood there. And I'm glad we, we won. Um, I'm for Bill 19. Like we, I thought it was all over, and it's not. But I'm here to protect our beaches for my mo'opunas, our generations to come, so that we're able to just enjoy the beaches. It's hard when I go into Hunananiho and it's just filled with limousines or the tour bus coming in or, or going to our small little park in Waimanalo called Kayonas. I, I can't even go. It's so crowded. We even have... Kailua running away from their area to come to Waimanalo. So it makes it hard for us who live Waimanalo to even find a space to park. So I don't even, I, and I live like a block away from the beach, I don't even go. So just my, that's my say. Just keep the beaches like it used to be. Mahalo. Thank you. Um, if we can, council members, um, Next uh, committee meeting, maybe 3.15, is that okay? 3.15. Again, uh, because of time, uh, if we can you know, keep it under a minute, that would help us a lot. Okay, let's see, who's next? Uh, Carrie, followed by Louisa, and then Richard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Carrie Johnson. I'm the owner of Custom Island Tours. Uh, for 2022, we paid over $18,000 in general excise tax. Uh, when I started my tour company uh, over 12 years ago, the idea was that we do private custom tours. And so a lot of our guests are elderly or people with limited, limited mobility who would rather not uh, get a rental car. Right now, you know, these beaches that we're talking about, when the tourists find out that they can't go there, you know, with a tour company, with a tour guide, then they just get rental cars. And this is adding to the problem where they're going two by two in rental cars instead of 15 or 20, you know, in, in buses. Um, so when we're doing our tours, you know, once we pass Sandy Beach, uh, there is not another beach that we can even stop at until we get, you know, past Kailua 
why, I mean, Kaneohe Bay has no beaches. The next beach that we can stop at after Sandy Beach is Chinaman's Hat at Kualoa Beach Park. And so, you know, this is um, kind of a dis discrimination against these kind of people, the elderly and the limited mobility that take these kind of custom tours so that they're not a burden on these bigger tours, uh, people with small children. So, you know, it kind of discriminates against them that they can't stop at these places. But if they were to go and get a rental car, then they could. But a lot of these people like the elderly, and we have a lot of customers from like Australia and Japan that drive on the other side of the road, they don't feel comfortable getting a rental car and driving themselves in a strange car on strange roads. And so this kind of discriminates against them. And so uh, thank you, director, for the map. That was great, showing all of the places that are currently banned. But besides the places that are banned by, by these ordinances, we're also banned from all state parks. And that includes all state beach parks. Um, and you know, there, there's a lot of restrictions on us to where you know, we're running out of places that we can legally uh, take our guests. And I am one of the companies that actually bothers to go down to the Parks Department and, and get a permit. I know you said that nobody's applying right now because we've kind of given up because the restrictions have been so, so you, ridiculous that um, okay. it's, it's not worthwhile anymore. Awesome. Can you um, wrap, wrap it up for yeah, me? I'm okay. finished. Thank you, sir. Thank Again, you, sir. you know, because of uh, th you have a question? I don't have a question, but I, I do have a comment. Um, I felt to uh, agree that there's discrimination occurring. Uh, first of all, for local people, uh, most of us um, will take our kopuna to the beaches in a private capacity. And uh, they also use the handy van. So for the targeted group you're talking about, I'm sorry, you can go to some of the other beaches. We're not denying you that. So I just want to make sure I just wanted to make a comment about that. Uh, the beaches are, are to be used by our local families first. And we will take care of our kupuna and make sure that they go to the beaches. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, let's see. Uh, Luisa Kiave, followed by Richard Ames and then Michael Waters. Aloha Chair Agi and the Council Members. And mahalo nui for being here today, Director um, Laura Dillon. My name is Louisa Kiawe, and I'm a voter for 20 plus years. My vote is based on justice and law. To prevail and to uphold laws and regulations, uphold protection and safety, and also to uphold we, the people of the Constitution of the United States. In this case, our Mayor Rick Blangar Blangiardi signed and approved the Bill 38CD2 on April 5th, 2022 to stop commercial activities in Kailua, Waimanalo, North Shore, and also Coco Lolio communities. It's now known to be an ordinance 22-3 as law. Bill 19 is a surpass to ordinance Bill 38, audience 22-3, uh, excuse me for that. So I humbly ask to oppose Bill 19 that is only to support commercial activities, which covers all types of profit activities, profit business, I meant. So recreation, okay, my apologies, I didn't know what to prepare for the rec recreational part. So recreation is a different word that can go both ways. So may I um, make a clarification um, on a comment that was made earlier about the four communities, Kailua, Waimanalo, North Shore, and Kokolio, who made a stand to stop commercial activities. And it's not our kuleana as far as what other communities are going through. They had the right to make a stand too. You know, they had, they, they had the right to, to come and, and testify and, and, you know, attend these hearings if they're able to. We didn't push or, we, you know, or we didn't create any kind of havoc, you know, with the other communities because of these tour buses, you know, just pops up and then the, you know, and then the community activities and, 
and were um, in wild parties. Ms. Calvin, so can you summarize? Can you summarize, please? Yes. Thank you. For um, my comment? Yeah, okay. for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, so my comment, what I meant is, okay, so um, our director, Laura Thieden, she made a statement earlier that because what we decided to do, it affected all the other um, communities. And it's understandable. But then again, some of us may or may not know what we faced, what we dealt with, you know, and what we believed in that we protect, you know. And also, as a protector of our Ibi Kapuna, it's so important to us, for those who have the understanding and know what it means. So in closing, did I? Thank you, yeah, if you can okay. In closing, can where'd it go? Okay. So in closing, um, let's see. Oh, just a reminder, it's about we the people of Hawaii and not the mega money businesses. My duty as a protector of Iwikapuna burials in Hunanani, Hawaii, Manalo, I will continue or wherever they may be. Mahalo and God bless you all for being here today for your time. Thank you, Ms. Calvary. Appreciate uh, you. Um, let's see. Richard Ames, followed by Michael Waters and Anna Lisa. My name is Richard Ames. I live across the street from the west end of Ali'i Beach Park, and I know exactly what we need, and that's no buses there. There is no parking there. So since there's no parking, they park up and down the street. Bill 19 will destroy our neighborhoods, commercial activities like tour buses and residential neighborhoods and parks cannot be justified or tolerated. Residential neighborhoods and parks are where we live, raise our children, have birthday parties, luau's, and interact with our friends and neighbors from all of Oahu. Every square inch of Oahu should not be open to commercial abuse. The mayor's response to the city and county when he sent Bill 34 back unsigned shows he is the impetus for Bill 19, which will return our neighborhoods to, the, to what preceded Bill 34, overrun with commercial abuse of our communities. Please vote no on Bill 19. We need to strengthen Bill 34 and Bill 38 with enforcement and penalties that will facilitate compliance, not weaken neighborhoods and empowering commercial activities like the tour bus industry, who have no restraint and no respect for the communities they invade. Protecting the residential communities and neighborhood parks should not have to be a fight. It should be a responsibility to build up and make better the the, for the citizens of Oahu. I suggest you define what a residential park is. My park, the, for over a mile down the road from how, where I live, is only parks churches. Uh, hold on, hold on, we get this the money, hold on, we, uh, we left, we, la we, uh, we lost the connection. Hold on. Oh, we have to, we, we don't have quorum, so. Okay. Yeah, but so, when we come back, yeah, hold on. Okay. Okay, if I can appoint Vice Chair Kiaina, so we can move on. All right. So if you can wrap up and uh, okay. summarize, that'd be awesome. Okay. Thank you. I suggest the uh, council define what a neighbor, residential neighborhood park is. And the point from the, uh, from the, uh, Ms. Thielen, local functions are exactly what our park should have, not commercial activities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Michael Waters, followed by Ann and an embassy. Yeah, my name's my <laughs> wow, that smile over there, Council Member Tapola. Tolba, excuse me. 
My name is Michael Waters. I'm here to say basically the exact same thing that I've been saying for four years. However, I would like to directly refute uh, almost everything in the testimony of Director Thielen. Every single one of those ideas from the weekends, Bing Pow, to limiting beaches, all of that stuff came from the industry. And she has the audacity to say that we were there for no regulations. A lot of you guys already have the proposals that I had submitted, and you know that's not true. Secondly, what happened at Hunana Niho is not the same as what happened to Kailua. If you cannot tell me where Ka'ale Pulu is, and you live in Enchanted Lakes, your opinion does not quite matter as much as those whose bones are buried in it. And that goes for me too. And as far as studying this place, as from somebody who has spent the majority of their life doing it, it is not the same as knowing this place. This is not the proper venue to have this discussion. We had a much better discussion at the picnic table at Ali'i. So we don't have aunties coming down here with broken legs every, every month for two years just to do the same thing over and over again. And everything that Auntie Kapua said, cosign. Other than maybe Honolulu, Waikiki, she definitely get more opinion than me. But other than that, full on cosign. What Council Member um, Kia Aina said to uh, my friend Kerry, and he is a good guy, he feels, or I would, for me in that situation, I feel similar as what you said, but that's, that's my, my kupuna, but it's not my place. So yes, like you said, you should be definitely first. But I promise you, if you put us in a room with these ladies, one, you'll get to see me ripped apart instead of being on that side of the table, which I know you guys are like. And two, I have all the faith in the world of the civility and the righteousness of the people of Hawaii. And thank you guys very much. Thank you, sir. Anna, followed by Bessie. Again, uh, out of respect, uh, we want to try to move this along so we can keep the testimony to a minute that would help us a lot. Thank you so much. I shortened it by about a million. So um, my name is Anne Alisa. I live in Laie, and I go to Kokololio Beach almost daily. Um, so I just wrote down my points. We were here, of course, talking about 48. It was signed on December 21st. Three months later, the new bill is proposed. So let me just to my points. Um, Kokololio does not have infrastructure. We have a little tiny bathroom, it's dirty, small, one working toilet on each side. I mean, something's gonna have to be done. Um, we have so many buses coming back since the bill was proposed. Uh, already, why? Um, uh, this will not be solved quickly. Somebody mentioned last time that it's, they've already been talking about this for 10 years, having an island-wide plan and then it might take three to six months, it's gonna take more than that. Why are the buses already coming back? We don't have any parks in our community. We have no public parks. That, that is our park. Okay. Um, 10 buses is way too many. That's what, 200 people, 500 people? No, we can't su support that. Even the starting time, eight to five, I think that's too long. But school gets out at two o'clock. Kids come to the beach. Parents bring their kids to the beach so they have a place to play. So I think the time needs to be addressed as well. And um, the starting time, too, because us Kapunas, we like to go in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That was good. See that? Isn't that that, that speed in this? That was awesome. <laughs> I love it. Don't tell me Kapunas cannot move the thing along. They know how. All right. Auntie Bessie, let's see if we can beat that. Oh, aloha. <laughs> And this is Auntie Bessie uh, Kamaki Aina. Aloha to all of you. Um, my husband was here several months ago and, and um, said his part and he passed away. So I'm representing him. We don't want commercial activity at the beach park, especially Kokolio Beach. We have been here at the city council several times to pass Bill 48. Bill 448 prohibits commercial activity on Oahu and beaches. Our beach at Kokolio Beach was created for family, gatherings, reunion, events, and it is a quiet and peaceful refuge place for our community. We are protecting our beach. There is EVs on the parks, Aina, 
Kokoli Beach, need to protect them, but no one has come out. How are we going to maintain this park if you allow these buses to come through with the tourists? We have no park keeper. Our restaurant facility is not maintained. So embarrassing. I'm not saying tourists cannot come. They do come in their rental cars, and we just want to protect Kokolio Beach. I'm not being discriminating, okay? Also, at Kokolio Beach Park, camping should be an online reservation with designated spaces. There is one large area that the park rents for $1,500 for the weekend. At times, residents cannot reserve the space. At the space, residents get to rent it for year after year. The same people get in. But our local families, small families, cannot rent because $1,500. Then they got to get all these other families to Kokua and split the costs. But I just want to let you guys know how I feel. Mahalo. Thank you, Auntie Bessie. All right, that was the last person on my list. Uh, we have anyone else? Uh, all right. Uh, please come up to the podiums. Please uh, state your name. And uh, again, we do have a lot of um, people online ready to testify. So thank you. Aloha kako. My kapaina kalahi ai hae kalavel ole hua ano ai ke aloha. O Malia, ko inoa, mai Mauna Lua, mai au. My name is Malia, I'm from Mauna Lua, aka Hawaii Kai. I am also part of Waimanalo. I don't, I, read, I did my written testimony, I'll make this very short. Of course, I oppose this bill wholeheartedly. My ohana in the back of me fought so hard for Bill 38. And we go through this process with the United States doing everything we can to follow the rules. And then one year later, we're back here for Bill 19. Kind of tiring when we Kanaka Maoli having to fight, fight, fight the illegal occupation of America, and we're trying to follow the rules, and then we get booted out. So, and then we get all these nice zooms and all your this, you know, description of how it can be better, and no is no. Us deserve a right for our voices to be heard, for community over commercialism, over tourism, making reservations. I think all tourists that come here should be making reservations for a more responsible tourism of all of our aina, but that's a whole nother thing. We need to stop, we need to protect, and if we have to keep coming here, and I have to go to UH and get my kid, we have a life but our aina is our kupuna. So please, just honor what was already put in forth and do the right thing. Keep on, just protect our aina. We, we love our tourists. I mean, I have plenty of tourist friends that come here, but I need to teach them how to be responsible tourists. And you cannot be coming in hordes and hordes and hordes to specific places of this aina it's just, it's, it's a balance. It's the yin and yang of how we do things. As Kanaka, we are so welcoming to others, humble, watch our mouth, how do we have to act? But it gets a lot tiring being over here when we thought we won something and then have to do it all over again. It's really frustrating. So mahalo nui for your time. Mahalo nui for hearing us. And I really hope the mayor just kind of listens to what he already okayed last year, and it, that's why we kind of feel the way we do. And I appreciate you, mahalo, ahui ho. Thank you. Go ahead and state your name, your first and last name, and, oh no, I got you, yeah, yeah, next person, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Aloha, so Tara Rojas, and I'm just going to reiterate that what she said. So the process, the system, it's just too much, too much bills, too much meetings, too much coming, and every year there's a new one. So Bill 38 just passed. They didn't even have time to enjoy you know, that it passed because now Bill 19 has been created. And I just wanna state, it happens also at the state, in the, the capital as well. So gay mammals were protected, you know, HB 1893, I'm just gonna state it for the record. And then here we go, we have SC 92 overriding that. 
and it got revoted again. So the system does not work. It does not favor Kanaka Maoli, and it does not favor the community, the people of this of this place. Number two, history and mindset. So if you look at you know the Hawaii Tourism Association, the website itself, and it started tourism. Go back to the history. One non Kanaka Maoli, one Haole, you know, is the person with the mindset that, oh, hey, let me advertise Hawaii. So profit over people. That's how it started. That has to flip. It has to flip. It has to change people over profit. And then so I'll all it to that. And we need a number. We need a moratorium. We need a cease and desist of development, developer, corporations, and of tourism. And then finally, lastly, number three, the format. One minute testimony is not enough. It's insufficient. Like um, you know, the other testifier said, we need a town hall. You cannot just one minute. It's like enough just to take a break, get it all out, and then go sit down. You know, to to spend the time to come here to to think about this, to read online. You need more than a minute. And then finally, Ohana Community First. No tourist access was suggested for this first part. And I just say, recommend and adopt this. So, mahalo. Thank you. OK. Clerks, is there anyone else uh, in person? Chair, sure, there are none. Okay, uh, seeing now we will proceed to remote testimony. Uh, let's see, I have Bill Hicks followed by Chun James. Uh, Mr. Hicks, are you online? And again, uh, out of consideration, can you uh, keep your testimony to a minute? Thank you, sir. Hello, Chair. I'm Bill Hicks, Chairman of the Kailua Neighborhood Board. I oppose the portion of Bill 19 that would eliminate the current provisions which prohibit commercial activities at Kailua and Kalama Beach Parks in Kailua. I support Councilmember Kia Aina's suggestion regarding CD1. While Bill 19 may be a step forward for most of Oahu, why should it be a step backwards for Kailua, Waimanalo, and the North Shore? Bill 11 of 2012 prohibited commercial activities at Kailua and Kalama Beach Parks. Prior to its implementation, Kailua Beach Park was being overrun with commercial kayak and tour bus activity. As currently written, Bill 19 would take a step backwards and allow the Department of Parks and Recreation to issue permits to authorize commercial activity at Kailua and Kalama Beach Parks. The number of people on the beach at Kailua doubled from 2007 to 2019 and were at an effective maximum ceiling. A resumption of commercial activity would take a parking and beach space and compete with family recreational activity, putting us past the tipping point. I urge that Bill 19 be amended to grandfather the existing prohibition of commercial activity at Kailua and Kalama Beach Parks. Mahalo. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Uh, any questions for the testifier? Okay, let's move on. Chun James. Is Chun James online? Chair, testify is not on. Okay, uh, let's move on to Abraham Iona. Mr. Iona, are you online? Chair, testify is not signed on. Okay, uh, let's move on to Michael. Ooh, this is one hard one. I'm not going to even attempt it. Michael H. Is Michael H. online? Chair, testifier is not logged on. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next testifier. Desiree Madison Biggs. Ms. Biggs, are you online? I am here. Okay. Hello, mahalo everyone. My name is Desiree Madison Biggs and I'm a resident of Haula near Kokololio Beach Park and friend of Anne and Bessie down there. Hi, you guys. Sorry, couldn't be there. I could have never imagined that I'd be here again so soon since we were just celebrating the unanimous passage of Bill 48 just four months ago. But I'm glad to be here again, fighting for what we all have been fighting for for the last year. And while I appreciate the progress represented in this bill, I oppose it as currently written, specifically as it relates to recreational stops by tour buses. Bill 48 and Bill 38 before it was passed late last year, providing a balance between the needs of local residents against the increasing incursion of tourism in all of our communities. Last year, you heard our needs as residents living in neighborhoods where beach parks exist, and you provided us the chance to protect our community beach parks while keeping it accessible to the many residents, locals, and other visitors that already enjoy it. Bill 19 undoes that progress. 
And first, while thoughtful as already stated, it's a one size fits all approach that does not account for the uniqueness of local communities and opens up all parks for tour buses to come and go as they please. And if you think they won't, you would be mistaken. Second, the complicated and detailed rules set forth would mostly be unenforceable given the resources today. Right now, Cocololio, there is no enforcement of any rules ever. Signs are ignored by tourists and locals alike, and we deal with rules being broken every single day, and the list of illegal activities is long. We only have four police up here on the North Shore. To expect police to know all the rules of this bill and then show up for infractions would be a waste of scarce and valuable resources. Furthermore, it is unreasonable and unfair that residents should be responsible to monitor everyone's behaviors and contact the police for infractions. Honestly, it's a part-time job. Finally, I wonder if the relatively low fines will not actually deter bad actors, but disproportionately affect the smaller operators, which nobody has a problem with. And the larger businesses can more easily violate the rules and just bake citation costs into their prices. In conclusion, Bill 19 in its current form appears to be a free pass for tour bus operators to visit any and all beach parks five days a week which I kind of like the idea of the, the weekends and, and um, no vacation day visits, that's good. But I would ask that the balance that was struck last year through bills 38 and 48 be given an exception to any new plan that is created. Mahalo Nui for your time. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to uh, our next Ingrid Peterson, followed by uh, Senator Kurt Favela and then Gary uh, um, Wheeler. Hi, Ms. Peterson, are you on? Yeah, I am, I think. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, aloha again, council members. My name is Inger Peterson. My family became residents of the Kalama part of Kailua in 63. My husband, Doug Selig, is third generation Kailua. We live in my childhood home. In the late 70s, when my mother was on neighborhood board, she helped in the creation of the public Kalama Beach Park because Kailua Beach should be easily accessible to all residents. We strongly oppose Bill 19 unless it is amended as council member Esther Kiaina proposed. Um, one size does not fit all. As surveys of resident beach goers have shown, official surveys, uh, over tourism is a big problem at Kailua beaches. Kailua Beach, I'm focusing on Kailua. You've heard from Waimanalo and I totally support them. Kailua beaches are so extremely popular with tourists that allowing three buses at a time, 10 per day, weekdays, eight to five, would once again swamp these beaches and entrances with extreme over tourism, overuse, uh, depriving residents of the ability to easily access and enjoy their public beaches. Mahalo Nui Loa for listening. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to uh, Senator Kurt Favela again. Uh, what we try to, what we want to try to do is just focus on the, the recreational and and uh, transportation and, and vehicles in the parks. Okay, Senator Favela is on. Chair, not signed on. Okay, uh, Gary Wheeler followed by Raquel Achu. Mr. Wheeler? I'm here. Um, I'd like to read something. A young senator, back when we first discussed eliminating commercialization at the beaches, stated this to Civil B. The Hawaii Tourist Authority should be required to manage tourism industry to ensure businesses are compliant with restrictions. And that it protect residents, comma, quality of life, comma, let's not commercialize beach parks, comma, and to keep the place of a respect for our families and our neighborhoods. That young senator was your Laura Thielen when she had a different point of view of what we see today. In my opinion, Esther Ina's exception of CD1 would be a very good uh, exception for our communities. I would be I would be wondered to give suggestions like tourist companies will not pay the fines; they'll accumulate the fines and then ask for forgiveness. For instance, so you're talking about progressive fines 
So how about after the third or the fourth fine, we confiscate their bus? You're not going to affect these people. They make so much money, it's incredible. They didn't, they constantly use their political powers to get changes. We're here today because most likely the tourist industry is lobbying for this initiative. And Laura Thielen might be somebody that cares about the communities. Um, I'm a member of the Little Hawaii Kai Hui, and we act actually- Mr. Testify. Wheeler, can you, can you summarize? Thank I'll you, summarize. sir, appreciate it, thank you. My, my summary would be, if it was in my decision, there would be no more tourists at any of our public beaches or our public parks at all. We, the people in Hawaii, are paying property tax for those beaches, not the tourism. And to have this affect us twice in a very short period of time is a waste of the citizens' time and energy and money. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, next is Raquel Chu, followed by Ms. Moniz and Mariana Kekaula. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Aloha Chair Toba Committee. Mahalo. Excuse me, I'm in the middle of my pastures here. A little out of breath. <laughs> so um, I've submitted written testimony of which I'll stand by, but I did want to comment on a couple of things that have come up. I appreciate Director Thielen's attempt to uh, enhance our restrictions, but I am opposed to this bill as the way it's written for fear that it will take away the restrictions that we worked so dearly for in Bill 38 and 34. Um, I believe there's great discussion here to be had uh, with regard to some of the recommendations of Director Thielen. Um, but again, we, re we come back to enforcement, right? And I just want to make it clear that our share that enforcement has been somewhat um, possible here on the North Shore. We have made strides with HPD on a certain couple, a few instances where we were able to acknowledge and uh, cite uh, offenders, but we also were able to work, and I'll give props to Inoa Tours Corporation, who reached out to our community, and we, we spent a day actually driving around, and they understood where our position was, and we've worked very friendly with them, and they've educated their drivers, which is critical. So I don't think it's just on you guys or us to educate, but also the employers. And finally, to the acknowledgement of the comment about discrimination, I, I, that's completely unacceptable because it's not about discrimination. It is absolutely 100% about kuleana. And your kuleana is your responsibility to do business here at the, at the uh expense of us, the residents. So I respectfully oppose Bill 19 and look forward to the further discussion and amendments that we can try to uh, expand upon. Mahalo. Thank you, Ms. Achu. Okay, uh, Ms. Palmoniz, is she online? Testifier is not logged on, Chair. Okay, uh, what about uh, Mariana Kekaula? Testifier is not logged on, Chair. Okay, let's move on. Uh, last three digits. Four, four, five. Are you on? Followed by Lisa Cates. Last four digits, four, four, five. The safari is not responding. Okay, uh, moving on to Lisa Cates. Lisa? Okay. okay. Hi. Um, so I just have some comments about Bill 19. Uh, the power to permit an activity in a specific park is executive in nature to be exercised by the Department of Parks and Recreation that has control of the property. Um, I'm from Kailua, and previously we went through the whole legislative process because every because although there were rules in place uh, with different administrations, different uh, council members coming through, these 
restrictions for, for our beach parks would be forgotten. So what I wanted to bring up, I submitted testimony, but in 1996, there was an environmental assessment done by the parks department for Kailua Beach Park that expanded the park to the current footprint that it was in and private property was taken for that. Previous to that, there was a bunch of land that was condemned. But what I wanna talk about is the environmental assessment really quick. Um, because that environment- Ms. Cates, can you summarize? And also we're talking yeah. about recreational stops. So- Yeah, okay, yeah. my point is, this is my point. The Department of Parks and Recreation cannot issue permits for any activity outside of the scope of that EA. It's against the law according to HRS chapter 343, and Director Phelan knows this because her mom brought it up when she was a representative for Kailua. This is all documented. So permits for Kailua cannot be issued unless a new environmental assessment is issued. Same for Waimanalo, because of the license agreement that was issued between Hawaiian Homelands and the City Parks Department, permits cannot be issued for Waimanalo for for the beach parks that are listed in the license agreement, only for the community events and for commercial film. Any recreational stops will be against that, will, you know, is against the license agreement. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was the last person on my list, clerks. Uh, is, is there anyone else? Sure, there are none. Okay, seeing no one, members, uh, we are in discussion. Council Member Tupola. Oh, thanks, Chair, for doing this and for uh, entertaining the discussion. You know what I really liked? I really liked uh, Ms. Medeiros' idea. I like the idea of, you know, if there's a parking stall that's filled, then no can. Only because our some of our beaches are so small, you can't even fit anything in there, so then, therefore, it shouldn't have a stop. But uh, I'm saying is that a lot of the rural areas, I mean, our, our areas are small. They're not meant for that. So I guess just the one thought that I had when she was speaking is that I really like that idea, but I also was kind of thinking through just geographically, like the area of Honolulu is just so different than just West Side North Shore is like, I... I'm not trying to, I, I just had kind of an epiphany of like, maybe it's not the size of the park or that it's near houses. It's, it's geographic, I think, because I think for the more of the town parks, maybe they have a parking lot that big. I can only think of one of my parks in my whole district that I think could fit a tour bus inside, maybe parked. And maybe we go from there, you know, rural beach parks versus town ones. But I, I do think that the testifiers had a lot of good information, so I'm hoping that we can incorporate some of that because I do think that we need to, to take all of their uh, real-life uh, suggestions into consideration because the every day of sitting and counting and trying to do your own enforcement, I think that without enforcement, the law is nothing. So we have to really take that into consideration. Thanks, Chair. I agree, and I think uh, if you guys can, all the kupuna and at this, you can tell your neighborhood to watch, go on a lelo and watch so that everybody else can be educated. I know it's not the most popular channel, but let's make it popular so that everybody can get educated. Uh, any questions? Okay, again, thank you guys so much. I know you guys travel far uh, to be here with us. I truly, truly appreciate your, your mana'o. So thank you so much. And everybody else online, thank you so much. All right, let's move on to uh, item number three. This is a presentation by the Department of Parks and Recreation on the status of projects funded through ARPA and the FRF funds and improvements are being conducted through the department. Members, you should have a copy of the presentation on your desk. It also is available online at the Department Communications D231. And I apologize to Council Member Wire. Uh, hopefully we can get done uh, by 3.30 even though I said 315. <laughs> yeah. Aloha, and we won't take up too much time. Uh, we're gonna shift the conversation a little bit. Um, and since you folks have the presentation in front of you, I'm just gonna get started, even though we're trying to get it up on the screen. So aloha, good afternoon. Um, Committee Chair Talba and Council Members, Kehaupu'u, 
uh, Deputy Director at Parks and Recreation. And today we want to provide some updates um, on our ARPA FRF projects, specifically today on our Youth Development Services project. Um, as I shared back in January, uh, the purpose of this project is to build a strong and more equitable Hawaii by investing in youth development over the next four years um, through five projects. So we have five, and these address program support, program design and development, evaluation and capacity building. Today, though, we're going to focus specifically on three of the five projects. They are um, design and development, capacity building, and summer fun. Yeah, so um, we have a category for summer fun. And we've brought some of our recreation staff here today. And, you know, these, these our staff are wonderful. They're on the ground working and engaging with community every day. So, you know, we, we do a lot. We're talking about um, the, the topic before, but uh, we are definitely serving community. And so I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter. Mahalo. Mahalo ke hao. Aloha, good afternoon, committee chair and council members. I am Shauna Makadangdang. I am the Children and Youth Coordinator with the Department of Parks and Recreation. Mahalo for having us here today and allowing us the opportunity to share with you some of the things that are near and dear to our hearts. For me, that is the summer fund support for our island keiki and youth. I know you are all very familiar with Summer Fun. It is a city-operated day camp where children are engaged in learning experiences and opportunities that help build upon their leadership and soft skills. Summer Fun is the largest program of its kind in the state. Here's a little tidbit for you if you didn't know. Summer Fun began back in 1944. It was in response to a community need for positive keiki engagement during World War II. Back then, it operated out of only 26 sites. This year, we will be conducting summer fun out of approximately 53 park locations across Oahu, and we are running 79 years strong. Not even the pandemic could keep us away. Our summer fund support for youth provides funding for our summer fund participants in Title I and Qualified Census Tract Communities, or QCT communities. It covers the cost of program fees. These fees are incurred during off-site activities or field trips, such as our bus fees, and our admission fees. It also provides for our daily snacks. During COVID, we were able to offer smaller, more modified programs that incorporated social distancing in order to provide those social opportunities for our island keiki. When Summer Fund finally opened for full capacity in 2022, we serviced 7,352 keiki between the ages of six and 13 years. We also provided leadership and volunteer opportunities for our teen population. We welcomed 868 junior leaders into our programs between the ages of 13 and 17. In all, this was a total of 8,220 children and youth. Of that total, 4,324 participants were from Title I and QCT communities. We were able to provide funding for program fees and daily snacks out of 33 of the 54 summer fund sites. That's 4,324 keiki who had the opportunity to participate in destination field trips. Some places they normally would never get to go. Places like Wet n Wild, Sea Life Park, Honolulu Zoo, even some of our beautiful botanical gardens. This year, excuse me, for some families, covering the cost of program fees can prove challenging, especially for those households that do have multiple children. In 2022, the allotment for program fees was $70 for Title I eligible sites. This year, we are really very excited to be able to waive um, our fees and increase it for $100 per Title I eligible site. And we will continue to provide daily snacks for our summer fund participants in Title I and QCT communities for a second year in a row. This year, we were also successful at federalizing our contracts for bus transportation, in addition to some of our big field trip vendors. Also, we are looking forward to providing for another community need, and that is online registration. Uh, this year, we will be conducting summer fund registration online with the hopes that it will alleviate some of the long lines in the parks, as well as oversee those camping in the, um, in the overnight in the parks. Um, lastly, to ensure that we continue to provide quality programs to our island keiki and youth, 
during summer fun, uh, we will be implementing our backward design for program planning. To share more about that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Darren Kimura and Mr. Alex Ching. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee chair and council members. My name is Alex Ching, and I'm a Recreation Support Services Coordinator for the Department of Parks and Recreation. I'm going to go over some of the things we have been doing in the department in regards to program design and development. We started about two years ago while still in the pandemic in a Zoom meeting mode. That was a good time to start reimagining what parks could, uh, parks and rec recreation could be uh, moving out of the pandemic and forward into the future. We contracted AMI CoLab to help identify common goals and ideals of all recreation staff on the island. We ended up with the intention to build the capacity of staff to utilize an outcomes-focused approach to program design and development in order to focus and increase program impact on community participants. DPR's program intended outcomes include health and wellness, sense of place and community, and leadership. With the help of AMI CoLab, we've devel developed a strategic vision and mission for the Department of Parks and Recreation Services and programs. We've also completed more than a year of staff training in a backwards design, outcomes-focused approach to program development. The development of tools is also completed to help us accomplish our goals. With this plan set in place, we've begun to implement this method into the planning and execution of some of our recreation programs. And I have Darren Kimura coming up here to discuss what we have going currently in our um, in progress. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, council chair and council members. My name is Darren Kimura. I'm the Leeward District Recreation Supervisor. Uh, my geographical area goes from Waipawa out to Makaha, from Eva Beach up to Makakilo. During year two, uh, in instructors created two learning tracks. One, of the lead one track is for the leadership team and the other for our line staff. Both we continue to use backwards design. Our line staff has started programming with intended outcomes in mind. These outcomes again include health and wellness, a sense of place and community, and leadership. The leadership teams are in a transition from learning from the trainers to manage with assistance with the ultimate goal as being able to manage our staff independently. District 3, we just held our TNT, which stands for Tomorrow's New Teens. Uh, there are eight to 12 year old participants in our overnight camp at Kualoa Regional Park. It was held on Saturday, March 25th to Sunday, March 26th. Due to the camp being partially subsidized using FRF, we were able to cover meals, snacks, a canopy for participants to sleep under, and a t-shirt for all participants that were able to customize to remember their camping experience. Some of the highlights of this camp were team building and problem solving activities, canoeing and free swim, and of course, campfire, songs, and s'mores. Um, now I have uh, Napua Kaitano, who will cover staff training and education. Thank you. Aloha committee chair and council members. My name is Napua Kayetano and I am the District 5 Recreation Supervisor uh, servicing our parks in the central Oahu area from Pearl Ridge to Wahiwa. Uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation has committed to invest in staff development and training opportunities to increase the quality of the services and the programs that are provided to our community. DPR has committed to invest in the staff by providing high quality and relevant training and learning opportunities that really support the interests and needs of the staff. To date, we have developed and implemented a division-wide training calendar and completed the spring 2023 training schedule. 
The Google training calendar that has been been developed is designed for easy accessibility by the staff. It allows them to keep informed of future and upcoming trainings and it allows them to register for the classes. For each training class uh, and workshop provided, within the calendar are embedded links allowing the staff access to the class description, instructor's biography, the um, contact information, sign up registration sheets, and also any resource material provided. A DPR training guidelines and ex expectation worksheet has also been developed with the intent to support the design and delivery of all this wonderful training that they're having. We want to ensure that all the training opportunities provided are engaging, impactful, and meaningful for the staff. The guidelines established promotes quality training by really setting the bar, setting the expectations for everyone involved at all levels, whether it be the trainer, the coordinators, or the staff. Next, I'd like to in introduce Kelsey Takahashi to discuss our training projects currently in progress. Thank you, Napua. Good afternoon, committee chair and council members. My name is Kelsey Takahashi. I'm the recreation supervisor for District 4 Windward Oahu, which covers parks from Makapu up the Windward coastline through the North Shore and all the way out to Mokulia. Thank you for giving my colleagues and I the opportunity to speak with you today. And next, I'll be sharing some current work that we're doing for staff development and training. Like Napua shared, the department is fostering the mindset of investing in the staff and investing in ourselves. The department is investing in the staff by committing to provide quality and relevant training and learning opportunities for staff at all levels. We're seeking out internal and external subject matter experts to provide relevant and innovative opportunities for our staff. Some of our recent training opportunities included topics such as engaging our senior citizen clubs, child abuse awareness, and our next upcoming training taking place in two weeks will focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion awareness and building a sense of place and community with our full-time staff. Alternatively, we're exploring ways to expand our learning past the traditional classroom environments. We will be collaborating with like-minded professionals and organizations to provide unique learning experiences out in our communities. We're seeking online training opportunities, resource materials, and other media resources so we can immerse our staff in various learning opportunities. While the department is investing in the staff, we also want staff to know and live the value of investing in themselves. We want the staff to nurture and uphold a growth mindset and understand the value of participating in a wide range of learning so they can expand their professional and personal growth. We want the staff to see the value in investing in themselves so they're prepared and confident to provide the quality and innovative programming, customer service, and community engagement. Lastly, we're developing a professional growth plan for staff at all levels. This plan will identify the training and learning an employee should have to confidently and competently perform in any given position within the division. This plan can also serve as a training roadmap for staff that are motivated to pursue higher positions. The plan can help the staff identify the types of training they can pursue as they prepare themselves for promotions or movement within the department. We look forward to using this plan as we develop and coordinate all future trainings and learning opportunities for our staff. Thank you. Um, that concludes an up, our update. Again, we just want to mahalo the council for your support um, in with this project, with this grant, um, where we have been able and are able to meet the immediate needs of our community that they have been impacted by COVID and then also invest in ourselves so we can continue to have um, impact in our community. Mahalo. Thank you, Deputy Director. Okay, do we have any questions? All right, we'll move on to in-person testimony. Uh, I do, yeah, I do have one. And I call your name, please come up to the podium, press the on off button on the base of the microphone and begin by stating your name, Michael Waters. I swear after this, you won't hear from me for a minute. Um, I would like to refute part of my testimony. It's also part of the reason why I testified to what I did in the last part. 
the setup of this is obviously a little bit intimidating, a little quick. I tried to get testimony in. Uh, the line I want to refute is that it is any other business owner would be in jail for using COVID release funds like that. I thought about it a little bit more, and I do understand that since you are hiring. Yeah, so I want to refute that part. However, the only thing that this does, as far as a fake parks and recreation ranger or rescue ranger, is it proves to me that you guys are way cooler with a legal business than you are with legal business. As a legal business that does everything that is asked, whether it's of you or from the community or whatever the case may be, I have a competitive advantage, disadvantage, and that's the case. That's the way this government was set up. It wasn't set up to help small businesses. It was set up to extract resources. And this parks program, while I get the intention behind it, and if there are adjustments and you hire the folks that are doing your job for free anyway, cool, maybe. But up until then, all you're doing is proving that this place prefers illegal business simply by the consequences of the actions of either one. So thank you. Sorry for. Oh, thank you. I remember this time. OK. Uh, let's see. I don't think we have anyone else on the list. Clerks? Do we have anyone? No, uh, no more registered. OK. Seeing no one, we'll pursue to, uh, proceed to remote testimony. Is there anyone that wish to testify online? Sure, there are none. OK. Seeing no one, uh, let's see. Yeah. Sorry. Seeing no, no one, uh, members, we are in discussion. OK. Thank you, uh, Department of Parks and Rec. We truly appreciate and uh, I love what you guys are doing with the, you know, the, the I was a junior leader for a long time. I, I know what that does and I appreciate you guys uh, stepping up and wanting to like get better at what you do. So thank you guys so much for that uh, presentation. Okay. Mahalo everyone for your participation today. Thank you, Council Member Wire. Uh, Five minutes? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, yeah, short one, short one. Uh, Mahalo, everyone. That's, there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.